So uh, next, we're going to be uh, going into a, a talk by Kaifu and the fireside style chat. So uh, I will maybe have a few time, a little time for questions. So warm those up in the meantime. Uh, so uh, we'll take it away to the next stage. Thank you. So uh, Kaifu, I was in New York City this uh, week as well and heard you speak in New York and uh, it was just amazing uh, the kind of reaction you uh, got from New York City. Do you think you'll get the same kind of reaction here in Silicon Valley? I, I hope so. This is uh, kind of like home to me. Sure. Yeah, it's a very different tech scene in New York City than here in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, but, um, and we're certainly more central to China here. But uh, Kaifu, um, what, do, what are your impressions of, of the week? I mean, what have you learned from the week? Uh, you know, you've been out on, the, out on the circuit talking about your book, talking about your ideas, which are really, really interesting. And maybe you could share some thoughts about uh, your book's premise, and uh, that would be great. Sure. Um, I wrote the book because I felt uh, I've been an AI researcher. I've built AI products, uh, and I've worked on AI business, and I've done AI investment. So it's kind of an all-around view about artificial intelligence. And I see the opportunities and also the challenges that AI will bring about. And when I read many of the other AI books, I felt there's a little bit incomplete or missing, and that with my experience, I could complete that. In particular, I wanted to address some of the specific AI challenges and what we can learn as humanity and what we need to do to rethink uh, a lot of things. Uh, why do we exist and um, what's the right social contract and how to deal with all these challenges that are brought about. So I talked to some um, book publishers and agents and uh, ex uh, expressed my um, uh, feelings of dissatisfaction with some of the current books on AI. And, um, and my publisher said, well, um, what do you want to write? And I said, I want to write about AI and the future of humanity. And the publisher said, well, you know, I think historians and philosophers probably write better than you do. <laughs> and he said, however, if you put China in there, I'll publish it. You know? <laughs> so, so I thought, well, that's not bad. There are a lot of things that relate to China. Um, on the current status of AI and the future of AI. So I managed to uh, build a buy one, get one free book. So, <laughs> so the book that you have or may have is 50% um, about what brought the miracle to China in entrepreneurship and AI. And secondly, with US and China co-leading AI, what are the opportunities and challenges and how do we deal with the challenges? Sure. So you, it's interesting that you say co-leading the AI evolution. Do you think that that's going to continue as a co-leadership, or do you think that one country is going to get ahead of the other? And what are the, what are the aspects of that? Uh, right. I think U.S. clearly leads in certain areas, and China already leads in certain other areas. Um, but, um, and if I were to say, I think U.S. clearly leads in basic research, uh, clearly leads in semiconductors, and clearly leads in business AI. That is the data warehousing, structure storage, that's required before you can do AI with uh, enterprise uh, uh, information. Uh, but I think China leads in the area of using AI with internet applications because of a larger amount of data, which is very critical to uh, making AI work. And I also think China leads in perception AI, that is capturing uh, information from cameras, microphones, and do recognition uh, based on that. Uh, I also think China leads in an entrepreneurial work style that is suitable for AI. Because to make AI work in implementation, it's about uh, iteratively gathering data, building prototype, gathering data, speedily iterating, improving, making the system work better and better with more data. And that's more appropriate to China style of entrepreneurship than more of a um, research technology, visionary style, that's more in Silicon Valley style. Mm -hmm. And I forgot one thing, uh, US is certainly ahead with robotics and autonomous vehicle. Mm 
So I think we can sort of call it 55-45 uh, US leading today, based on what I described. Um, but I think we are also, um, I think the big uh, wild card is whether or not there will be a big research breakthrough in the next five or 10 years. To the extent there is a big research breakthrough, that's likely to be led by Americans, and that would give the lead clearly to the US. But to the extent there's not a research breakthrough, China is actually much better at very quickly implementing and building. And that's likely to take China's 45 into a larger number of leadership. So there are a lot of unknowns in the prediction of the future. But before I end, I want to say this is not a zero-sum game. I know people have to I know I have to give the answer I gave, otherwise you would uh, not leave satisfied. <laughs> but think about two things. One, what's the goal of American AI? It's to make Americans have a better life, right? What's the purpose of Chinese AI? It's to make Chinese have a better life. This is not a battle for oil or land. It's not the case where the US has more, China has less. So it is not a zero sum game. Furthermore, if you think about the ecosystems that have been built, the Chinese system is Chinese VCs funding Chinese companies, building products for Chinese customers. Americans is American VCs funding China, American companies, building products, products for American customers. They don't intersect. It's not like Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent does any business in the US, and it's not like uh, Amazon, um, um, Facebook, and Google does much business in China. So these are really two parallel universes. So one can grow as large as it wants. It does not squeeze the other. Okay, well that, that's good. I'm sure that's music to their ears here in the audience. Um, so now, uh, when you talk about there's not been an AI revolution in many years, uh, why, why is that? Because AI came up uh, how many years? Like a couple decades ago, and then kind of went silent for a long time, and then all of a sudden this burst. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about that. Okay, I think there are two very big things. Uh, one is data, and the other is uh, machine learning, more specifically deep learning and algorithms around that. So let me tell you a story about data. Uh, I did my PhD thesis in 1988. Uh, when my thesis came out, nobody believed the results I got. They were amazingly good. And um, in fact, so good that people forced me to publish my data, and uh, eventually, for my pride, I published my source code to demonstrate it was real. Uh, I forget about the technology stuff because that's all outdated. But what I, and the secret weapon I had was the largest database in the world. And guess how large that is? A speech database, largest in the world. It was 100 megabytes. <laughs> See Amazing. how quickly, how quickly people forget. <laughs> yeah. You know, a poor grad student. My advisor was generous enough to spend a hundred thousand dollars for that hundred megabytes of data. So imagine. Um, you know, if AI is fueled with data, and I, all I had the world's largest database was 100 meg. People who do speech research today are using 100 T. So that's one million times more data. Uh, so that, I think, is a huge difference. And that, again, refers back to China's advantage in having more data. Maybe later we can talk about that. But the other thing is you have all this data, you have to take advantage of it. Uh, by using learning technologies that also have a large parameters that can absorb the data, benefit from the data. The more the data, the better it works. And the technologies that I had, I invented at the time was optimized for the 100 megabyte of data. It worked really well. In fact, it beat the close to deep learning types of approaches because those were not trainable <clears throat> on so little data. But as data increased, it was demonstrated that you can train neural networks with thousands of layers, and you can make these very complex um, um, self-learning systems. And then when you have large amount of data and more complex models, it, uh, suddenly we found out that these systems require fairly little human intervention. That, by pre that, what, that the amazing thing about deep learning is when you have a huge amount of data, um, you actually don't have to teach it concepts and features it can discover them automatically and mathematically. And I think those are the breakthroughs that gives me assurance that this time it won't be another AI winter. Uh, we see in applications, all the internet AI companies are profiting from it 
by using AI to do ads targeting, e-commerce, um, and the search, and uh, also uh, speech recognition, face recognition, a lot of things that uh, were below human accuracy. Uh, as much as I was proud of my thesis, it was way l worse than humans. But today, uh, speech recognition is beating the average humans, uh, even the above average human recognition. Face recognition is way better than humans. The company, a company we funded can recognize three million faces. How many of you can do that? <laughs> right? So I think, we, I think even on things that we thought were innate to human, right? once we thought Go was a game that AI could never play, it beat us, we thought that uh, at least for perception, we are better for speech and uh, vision. But now computers are better. So I think that's just going to continue through harder tasks like robotics, uh, autonomous vehicles, and I think a lot of value would be, will be generated uh, based on what we can see today. So you also are running an AI lab in Beijing and investing in many, many companies, many startups, including many AI startups. And um, what are the kinds of startups that you see coming up in AI that you think um, could lead to a breakthrough? Or is there, what, what do you think is the next level for AI? What does it need to get to? And is there a startup that you're looking at today that might get to that next level, that, this next breakthrough? It's possible. However, I think we're really undergoing a phase shift in AI startups from the age of discovery to the age of implementation. When I say discovery, it means you start a deep mind like company. You say, well, we have the world's smartest researchers. We're going to invent lots of great things, and then we're going to figure out what problems to apply them to. That was kind of the, um, the height of the discovery type of research. Uh, your success is determined by your collective IQ and H index, right? Things like that. And I think at this point, the various learning algorithms, deep learning, reinforcement learning, transfer learning, uh, are reasonably well understood that a smart AI engineer can be given the problem and put the puzzle together and build a workable solution to solve that problem. Um, and and that calls for a different makeup of a company. So I think the kind of company we would like to fund today facing most problems would be a CEO who is a business person and then a very strong product solutions leader as well as a CTO who's the AI expert. But probably we want a CTO who's more of an AI engineer who's happy to use open source to build things fast as opposed to take technical risks. So this is important when you think about China and US because if you were in the age of discovery, US clearly has the lead mm -hmm. because there are just 10 times more top researchers than in China. But in the age of implementation, it's the Chinese entrepreneurial style um, and all the entrepreneurs who've grown up in the competition, in the pivoting, in the lean startup um, that, that, uh, that, that gives them the advantage. Yeah. So in looking at that, uh, our investment style has shifted from looking for who's got the most smart PhDs to one where uh, we build this AI institute. And the way this works is uh, we, the investment team, throw a lot of interesting problems for the engineering teams in our AI institute to solve and to see how far they can get. And when they get somewhere, we will say, it's time to build a company. Let's find us a, a CEO, a chief uh, product officer, and a CTO. The CTO may come organically from the team, but all the engineers join us uh, knowing very well that we're not an incubator and that none of them will be the CEO because we're onto the phase of implementation. So we did one experiment uh, so far. We've only launched one company from the AI Institute, and that company is called AI Novation. Kind of a, a little bit pun. Uh, Great pun, name. Uh, yeah, very funny name, but uh, they named it themselves. But we actually built the CXO suite above the team that built the original products. And they're going in the area of AI for retail. If you think about uh, Amazon Go, uh, that, that is the fancy luxury experience. That's $10 million or however, whatever it took to build. So our AI innovation, they're building products, computer vision-based pastry checkout. Uh, you just buy your pastry and scan it, and instantly you're charged 
for, and that machine is like $800. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're permanently replacing a cashier, right? Mm -hmm. And where they're building things like uh, automatic um, inventory taking of, of by, by computer vision and depth sensing okay. in a store. So no longer do you have to have manual help. They're building sales forecast, inventory forecast. They're also, of course, building the autonomous store features that will eventually get to the Amazon Go stage. And we think retail is an area in China that's undergoing a big change because retail in China has been suppressed by the growth of e-commerce. So people just don't want to start a company doing retail because e-commerce is so strong. But now e-commerce has kind of taken what it could and now retail is interesting again um, because now you, now you can think about um, the reason retail lost to e-commerce was that <clears throat> at the end of the day, you knew at your store you had a stack of cash and you lost, you, 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 your inventory had uh, 10 tins of fewer beer, 20 cans of less uh, uh, Coke, but you really don't know who bought what, when, and why. Um, and online, you do because of cookies and tracking. But now once you have the sensor and uh, camera technologies in store, you can too. So that suddenly makes retail an interesting proposition. So to make a long story short, we put the company together about nine months ago. We're now in the second round of financing. The company will generate a substantial revenue and hopefully become profitable in about two years. And that's what happens when you have a sales leader at the helm. It's not about raising money, burning money, hiring PhDs. It's about solving problems for customers. It's about finding a customer who is a leader in that industry who can teach you about that industry and having the humility to hear from what the customer wants as opposed to the arrogance of a technical architect that says, this is my platform, you guys adopt it. Mm -hmm. So I know I didn't answer your question. This is not a breakthrough company. <laughs> but, but as I said earlier, China is not the land of breakthrough companies. Yeah. It is the land of finding opportunities to make great businesses. So maybe it's something where AI doesn't make mistakes. Is that in the realm of any possibility? Well, I think AI makes a lot fewer mistakes than people in the domain in which they're developed. Yeah. And actually, I think AI can do things you can't imagine people can do. I'll give you another example of company we invested in. It's a loan app. It's an app you download to your phone. And if you want to borrow 200 to $1,000, you Type in your name, address, how much money you want to borrow, and your national ID, uh, name, number, like it's your social security number equivalent. Uh, take a picture of yourself and submit. And also it will say, will you agree, consent, to send the data from your phone up to get the loan approved, only for the purpose of approving the loan. Uh, but the data is not everything on your phone. It's basically what uh, you know, Google and Facebook is allowed to get by the that's set out by Android um, uh, to, to, to allow to be sent up. So this app sucks up all that data and in about one second decides whether to give you the money. If it does, it's zapped to your phone. And its default rate is about 3%. So you can imagine at interest rates of 24%, 36%, there's a huge profit to be had even with the default rate. I mean, would any of you be willing to just go out there in the street and say, hey, anybody, here's $300. I'll find 100 people to give $300 to and then hope that they'll give you back. Well, you get it back, right? But the system is trained on a lot of past behavior, uh, not on humans labeling, uh, this is a good person, this is not a good person, but on actual outcome. This is the great thing about AI, is it's trained on outcome. It's trained. Well, in order to have outcome, you got to lose, lose a lot of money. <laughs> so you start the thing running, you loan to 10,000 people, maybe the default rate is 15 or 20 percent. You lose a bunch of money. That's our VC money we invest. <laughs> <laughs> and then you train the AI, it gets better. So next iteration, it's maybe 9 percent default rate. Yeah. And then it keeps getting better. Okay. And then what we find, you're asking me about accuracy, yeah. what we find is that uh, the accuracy of these systems are beyond our imagination because we went in and said, okay, we just took it as a black box and threw all the things at it. What did you actually use to make the loan determination? Obviously, there's your address, 
uh, your zip code. I know some people have questions about that one. Um, your, um, uh, the speed in which you type your address, because you're faking it, you might be slow. Um, and um, also your, your, your um, national ID, whatever criminal record it could find on the, on the web about you or not. Um, also the apps, uh, you know, do you have gaming apps? Do you have gambling apps? Uh, so it's got, and also the type of phone. You know, obviously, if you have a top-of-the-end iPhone, you're more likely to pay back. So all the things you can imagine. But, that's, but if, you, if you were asked to enumerate how many things on your phone can contribute to making a loan to you, you probably get stuck after 40 or 50. But actually, it has 3,000 useful features. Wow. And, and the number 3,000 feature is the battery level. <laughs> right? You would think, how could this possibly matter? But it does. Think about it, it matters a tiny little bit. If you're the kind of person who runs out of battery, <laughs> you're probably a <laughs> tiny bit little less responsible than, sure. the, than the next person, sure. right? But that's what the, the wonder of machines. Sure. It's not that battery level determines whether you get a loan or not. Imagine the 3,000 features each gets votes, right? right? Your income might get 1,000 votes. Your battery might get one vote. But still, that's a little vote. Everything's voting and everything's decorrelated. So that's how you get to the 3% default rate. So when you ask, you know, can AI be perfect, I would say that the perfect human cannot possibly get to that default rate because we have no way of correlating 3,000 features. Okay, so Kavanaugh, uh, 3,000 features going into a decision. I, should not, I know I should have said that, but uh, it came to my mind. Um, anyhow. Um, well, there is, uh, there is a judge's assistant that's in my book described that's able to do the following three things, some of which you might not like, but I'll tell you like it is. iFlyTech is a company in China that builds uh, multiple features sold to courtrooms. The first thing it does, it's sold to police department actually, is during police interrogation, it has, it's basically fully recorded, um, and, and then the actual video and audio is correlated against the report written by the police officer to ensure there's no distortion of truth compared to the actual session. The second thing that it does is an evidential comparison by looking at the both sides, the plaintiff and, and the, uh, um, the uh, um, acute, what is it? The, the plaintiff and defendant, right? Each submitting all the evidence, it checks all of them for inconsistencies. And rather than having lawyers have to argue all that, it just says, these following 10 things are inconsistent. You should check out who's right. So it saves a lot of time. Yeah. The last thing I have to, for full disclosure, is uh, a sentencing assistant. So based on all the evidence, if a person is found guilty, it comes up and suggests, based on past cases uh, of this type of violation, what type of sentence might be the norm. And then, of course, the judge can override that. So it is used already in the courtroom. Oh, that's great. Um, sounds very useful. I'm sure everyone will think it's great, but I'm just well, reporting to you it oh, is being okay. used. Okay, well, we all want to get to the truth, whatever the truth is. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, so Kaifu, uh, one of the things I know both of us have observed of the China entrepreneurial system and the Silicon Valley entrepreneurial culture is that um, you know, have this 996 going on or 997 going on in, in China. In Silicon Valley, you have the 888 or 875. I mean, is this going to hurt uh, the U.S. chances long run that uh, we don't have this kind of, you know, crazy work ethic of, mm. you know, uh, what do you think? I mean, and is this, does it matter? Um, yeah, I think it's, one, it's a fair observation. Uh, Chinese entrepreneurs work very hard. Um, every two years, I take my top entrepreneurs to visit the Silicon Valley, and usually they end up with two conclusions. One is, wow, very creative, and the other is, wow, they don't work very hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they observe this by going to top giants parking lots and notice the cars are gone at six, right? They try to schedule evening meetings and weekend meetings. Nobody will see them, so they're forced to, to go to Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so it's, uh, it, 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 it is a difference, okay. Uh, however, I would take a step back and say, actually, that's kind of one of the differences, but the actual core difference is the Chinese entrepreneurs have come up with an entirely different entrepreneurial style 
Whereas in the Silicon Valley, people here prefer what's visionary and technology changes the world, then in the universe. Um, in China, I think it's much more pragmatic, uh, com creating value, and also it's pr preventing copying, right? Because as you know, China started its internet business with a lot of copycat behavior. Now this is not the illegal IP violation, this is just, you know, more like um, Facebook copying, Snapchat kind of copying, okay? Um, and, and if you're in an environment where there's a lot of copying, you know, when Groupon started, China had 5,000 ground Groupon copycats. Uh, what do you do to win in that market? It's kind of hard to say I'm gonna innovate and invent the next, you know, brilliant technology. That's not the solution. The way you win in a competition in that kind of a business is to build a business model that is, has a, such a high wall that it makes it impossible for your competitor to climb over. So that is the response to be the, the, this, the cat, copycat ori origin that causes this uh, deep thinking in a, in a true business school stud worthy of business school studying sense, how to build an uncopyable ecosystem. So if we could take three minutes, let me explain one to you. Yeah. Um, so you all know Yelp, right? Great company, well use it, wonderful. But the Chinese equivalent is Dianping, which was acquired by Meituan. So it's now it's called Meituan Dianping. That company is different from Yelp or Groupon or OpenTable in the sense that it doesn't try to build around the way you eat. It tries to change the way you eat, right? It thinks about, okay, if we could deliver food, Chinese are always after efficiency, if we could deliver food to the home, what would it take for people to cook half as much and to eat out half as much? That's the level of ambition. And then it turns out they found out what's needed is a 30 minute delivery from the time you order, including cooking time, at a delivery charge of 70 cents. If they got to that level, then the country would be won over. So they proceeded to figure out how to build that kind of a thing. And it turns out that includes a combination of AI technologies, about routing and all that, but also uh, the very hard work of managing 600,000 minimum wage employees uh, who are, who are um, they found a way to incent these people to, uh, on the one hand, uh, work when they need to work. Essentially, they use the reverse search pricing, right? You know how Uber, you get a search pricing when there's demand and supply is imbalanced. Here you've got these delivery people who are incented more to go deliver when there is a scarcity of deliverers versus orders. Um, and you have to figure out um, how to manage 600,000 people. Um, these are not people who could be driving a Uber or a DD, because if they could, they would. So these are people who had less education, less skills, less communication capabilities. Well, how do you train such a sales, uh, such a delivery force without damaging your brand or their courtesy to your customer? And they have to deal with what are, what's the vehicle that would do the delivery. It's not going to be Uber Eats. That's too fancy, too much gasoline, too much waste. So it's electrical mopeds and very cheap ones. Yeah. And cheap ones have batteries that are depleted. So they have to build battery um, not recharging because that would waste, that would uh, destroy your 30 minute dis uh, delivery. So it's a battery replacement station. So you're halfway in your delivery, you're almost out of batteries. The AI would program for you, stop there. Give, give that person your battery, take this other battery. <laughs> so anyway, I could go on, but you can imagine the kind of hard work that it takes to build this 600,000 delivery workforce. It's not Silicon Valley at all. Uh, along with it, well, so what are the qualities that causes someone to do that? It's tenacity, it's desire to win, it's hunger, um, it's dedication and hard work, as yeah. you said. But not just that, but then the outcome the, the, the trophy that Meituan gets is a, a almost impregnable wall that says if you want to compete against me, you raise a couple of billion dollars. Sure. You hire 600,000 people. Yeah. yeah you go be IPO. <laughs> well, right? Meituan's IPO was uh, $50 billion right. Right, compared to um, a couple of billion for, for sure. the three American companies. But I, and it's amazing that the entrepreneur behind this company, uh, Meituan, is the cloner, right? Known as the cloner. That's <laughs> he, right. That's he right. Cloned, Wang Xing. 
Twitter. He cloned Facebook. He cloned Friendster. 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 And, and it, Groupon. so it has is this guy gone up the up the up the ladder in terms of innovation, or is he still just copying? No, he clearly <laughs> has right. These these models are new, and he came up with them. See, I, th I think that this is a Silicon Valley thing: is that you think someone who's cloned four companies <laughs> is just not worthy. Probably many of you think that, or many of your friends think that. But think about how did we how did we learn art or music? Did we not start by copying other people? And once we got good at it and practiced, we said, OK, let's draw my own art, have my own style. Can you really become an artist without learning from the masters? So I think if you think about when, when, when Wang Xing started his first business, internet penetration in China was 0.2% versus 30% in the US. So he knows so much less. So other than resorting to cloning, uh, there was no way for him to get started. And of course, there are people who copy four, five, eight, ten times without ever learning anything. They purely clone, <laughs> and these people don't succeed. Right. But when you clone and succeed or fail, and you learn and you grow, then you learn how to build products, how to optimize, how to satisfy users. And finally, you learn how to innovate. This is actually possible. Now, you would say that, well, what I just described from Meituan is not innovation at the iPhone level. Certainly, it might not be. But if I were to show you the Meituan app, or the WeChat app, uh, or the VIP Kid app, or the Mobike app from China, you, most of you would be impressed. And you would say, that's pretty innovative. So I think the question I pose to you is, if the outcome is a pretty innovative, very useful app, uh, does it really matter that the founder of the company didn't have a light bulb go off and with the vision to change the world? Sure, sure. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about um, American companies getting into China. And uh, we first met when you were at Google China in Beijing, yes. and uh, before Sinovation Ventures. And uh, I think, um, what, what is your opinion of, can US companies get into the market today and succeed? And uh, what, uh, what are the lessons that they can learn from others that have gone down this path and have not succeeded? You know, in 2005, when I uh, went to start Google China, the parallel universes had not been built. Okay, Perhaps in US, there was a little bit of one. In China, it was still um, basically greenfield. There was a chance, I think, for a Google or um, a Facebook or another company to give it a shot, okay? Um, if it were willing to follow the local regulations, of course, that's always an if, and if you don't, then you don't go, right? Um, and by this time, I think the user's habits are very, very strong, and the intertwined nature of the apps and the stack on your phone is such that it's quite difficult for someone to go, an American company to go to China. So let's say if um, you know um, Pinterest or uh, Snapchat wanted to go to China, how would they deal with the fact that people spend half their time on WeChat? How would they deal with the fact that they used to know how to lure people from Facebook, that there's no Facebook? Um, how would they deal with the different tiers of users in China? China is not one market. It's actually more like a, a combination of um, market a little bit like America, a market a little bit like Southeast Asia, and a market a little bit like Africa, uh, but more advanced than they are, but, but similar in terms of you know, demographics and um, uh, disposable income and, and the like. So dealing with these, this complex stratified market with these dense urban cities, with these different stacks in the software stack, I think any American company it would be a very daunting challenge to enter the the mobile slash internet space at this point. Right. Do you think Google, if they do go back into China, can they succeed today? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So one of the things you mentioned uh, in coming back to the U.S. and uh, trying to get acclimated with the mo with the payment system that we have here in the U.S. Yeah. No credit, you know, credit cards, cash. So uh, how, how are you adapting? Uh, this week, your week here in the U.S., and how, how are you dealing with it, <laughs> with paying for things? <laughs> well, I forgot to take cash when I landed in the States, and I sent a message to my wife, 
And she was panicked. She said, oh, no. <laughs> you thought WeChat worked everywhere. <laughs> and do you, you know, and, then, and she was like trying to come up with solutions for me. And I said, well, I still have an ATM card from Taiwan. And that I can get some cash. And she says, OK, you're OK. But you know, if you go to China today, for those of you who haven't been to China for two or three years, be warned that um, it, your, your credit card won't be accepted in many places and your cash won't be accepted in many places. If, when, when you go to China's uh, farmer's market, people hold up a UR code for you to pay through WeChat. Beggars hold up a UR code. <laughs> they no longer have pans to collect cash. Um, and robbers uh, would, would rob stores and get nothing, you know. They would rob three stores, get caught by the police with only $160. <laughs> so this is, uh, and China mobile pay last year was $17 trillion, US dollars. It's larger than China's GDP. So this, I think, is a lesson um, for, I think, for American business and entrepreneurs. It's a lesson in a few ways. One is that may America, who had the previously leading infrastructure in landline, credit card, shopping malls, be facing a disadvantage as China, who had a disadvantage uh, situation, leapfrog from landline to mobile, from yeah. credit card to mobile, from uh, shopping malls to the new retail I described. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, something to think about. Secondly, uh, credit card companies, uh, they're really um, parasites on the economy. And how will you get rid of them? And if you don't, how will you deal with the 2 or 3% tax that you pay? I think these are serious questions to ask. And, and also, how did mobile payment become successful? It is through this type of gladiatorial competition. It's Alibaba and Tencent throwing you know, one or two billion dollars of subsidies to get people to link up to their credit card systems. And that was the brute force way that it happened. And fourth, about government policies. If, if um, David and I were each to start a um, mobile payment company in the US, and we both got a billion dollar funding, and we started making some traction, what would happen? Credit card companies would probably go lobbying, saying, oh, software people don't know how to security. Your, your only money is only safe with us. We understand finance. We understand security. And might the government regulate or step in? Might there be taxes, investigations, law bill, laws to pass? And that is a challenge, because China has a um, very technocentric utilitarian approach to adopting technologies, which says, I'm going to let you give it a shot. If things go wrong, I'll regulate. If things don't go wrong, I'll let you keep going. And that's what happened in mobile payment. Uh, it's not always that way. Cryptocurrency didn't go that way. Um, Chinese government said, well, give it a try. Then all this money laundering and their village ladies starting to pay, get into ICOs. And they said, OK, we need to put a stop. And how do you stop it? And they couldn't find any way to stop it other than outlawing the whole thing. So they did. So these are all, I think, lessons to be learned about um, uh, the, 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 late, the late movers' advantage about government utilitarian approaches to government regulations and about considering that some of the previously leading infrastructure that U.S. had, how to get rid of them so that U.S. doesn't let other countries uh, leapfrog. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Kaifu. That was really excellent. And I really highly recommend Kaifu's book. It's a must read. Uh, I've read it um, straight through now. Um, and actually, not straight through, but on several flights. <laughs> but Kaifu said, it's not that long. And I said, well, you know, an hour. It, it's, it, it is heavy. It, it's some, of, some parts of it, when you, particularly when you get in the four stages of AI. Wow, that's really deep thinking. But I highly recommend his book. It, it's a real breakthrough book. And uh, congratulations to thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Let's give a Kaifu a round of applause. Thanks. and. Uh, He'll be signing a few more books in the back, uh, so thank you.